Welcome back to the show. A pleasure to see our next guest joining us. Uh, of course, he has a fascinating job, but uh, a really interesting aspect of it just unfolded on a recent trip that he took with some uh, people via the Vancouver Aquarium. That's right. Dr. John Nightingale is the president and CEO of the Vancouver Aquarium. John, how are you? Great, thank you. Good. Nice so to tell see us you. about this trip that you just did to Haida Gwaii. Well, once a year, the aquarium takes a group of people somewhere in the world to go exploring. And every three or four years, we've typically gone to Haida Gwaii. It's called Canada's Galapagos. Yeah. It's an amazing place. Um, so we, we go exploring. We spend a couple of days uh, up on Graham Island, the, the North Island in Mass, and it's good to get learning about contemporary Haida issues. And then we get onto a sailboat and go down through the Gwaihanas Park Reserve, so the southern island, Moresby Island. And if the weather is good enough, we deke around the end or through a, through the out to the west coast, and have a look at the open ocean. What were you expecting uh, this year? Were you expecting this to be just uh, you know an extension of trips that you've had before and, and an educational experience? Yeah, I mean w we go because the uh, the land habitats are amazing, the stories are amazing, the Haida culture is amazing. Um, and uh, we go for the wildlife. You often see humpback whales, sometimes mm -hmm. orcas. We really do live life. in an incredible part yeah, of the world, do. and I think we really do forget that sometimes. Yeah, we do. Do, we you do you find that anybody who's had the pleasure or privilege of going out on a boat in that yep. area, it's just yeah, amazing. Did it, does it ever right. cease to astound you? No. I mean, I, even walking around Vancouver on a wonderful sunny day like yesterday, right, you have to stop and think, wait a minute, we could be 40 degrees and 98% humidity. Mm -hmm. you know, which do you, which, which right. is better, right? Yeah. So, Okay, uh, let's talk about what you uh, discovered on this trip. We're going to look at some photos that mm -hmm. will tell the story. So let's bring up the first Something picture here. Something of a here surprise. And tell us about what we're looking at. So this is a picture of a, of a Zodiac, which is a, an inflatable rubber boat that typically... Uh, uh, any ecotourism boat uses to ferry people ashore. So we are just in the process of going uh, from the boat over to unload a boat full of marine debris that we collected. Marine uh, debris is common on the west coast here. It's on all beaches and it can be locally various things. Maybe you can tell us what you usually find. So we've been to, wow. we've done beach cleanups before in Haida Gwaii and you usually find a number of fishing floats which are broken free from nets. You find things, you might find a detergent bottle with uh, Russian writing on it or, or Chinese or Korean or Japanese that, you know, was thrown overboard from a merchant ship. So you find debris and in fact... But what else is in this photo? What's in this photo that's unusual are all those pieces of foam. So that's what we'd never seen before. And the first hint we had was when we sailed around out on the open ocean, you might see the odd fishing float, but you'd never see anything else. And to come around out onto the open Pacific and see the surface dotted with pieces of foam, mostly sheet foam. So yeah. those are broken up pieces ranging from the size of your thumbnail up to the size of a desk. And, um, and of course, it, it washes up onto the beach. And how did you discover that these were uh, pieces of debris from the Japanese tsunami? Well, the, the, in, in Japan, as I've come to find out, when they insulate houses, as opposed to rock wool or blown-in insulation that we use here, they tend to use rigid foam panels. And, of course, when the tsunami flattened, not yeah. only houses, but industrial buildings and everything else, what would float but the foam? Foam would come floating right out to the top. And so, with the tsunami debris field, um, the foam is at the front end, or closest to us, principally because it, it's light and the yeah. wind is giving it an assist. So it's at the head of the parade, so to speak. Uh, how much did this surprise you? I, I mean, we've heard various meter reports and, and people, climatologists and, and people that study wave pattern and, and, uh, and current patterns and stuff knew that this was probably gonna happen, but how surprised well, were you? Uh, very surprised. I mean, because intellectually you know you're going to, you're, that's what's happening. And yet, to come around the corner and, and, and be out looking at the open Pacific and see the surface dotted with foam, the captain, none of us had ever seen that before. Yeah. And so when we, we did go to a beach, to, we thought, okay, let's go do a cleanup. We picked a beach that was maybe 75 meters long, and we completely filled a Zodiac and a half with bags of, of principally wow. two things, principally foam yeah. and uh, plastic drink containers. So in Japan, there are vending machines everywhere. You can be at the, yeah. out in the country at a crossroads. Yeah, anyone who's find, traveled there, right. yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. And, and most of those drinks are either in little cans or, if it's coffee, or, mm -hmm. or 
plastic bottles, hundreds of them, um, wow. on the uh, on the beach, and so. We cleaned up an entire section of beach. So you say this is at the beginning of the parade, as you said. What is to come here uh, that we haven't seen yet as far as debris from the tsunami goes? So we saw, we heard about the big dock that washed up on the shore of Oregon, or we yeah. heard about the motorcycle in yeah. the container. So those, those things both stuck up in the air and got a good wind assist too. So what's coming now is, is more in the water. So, for instance, uh, a report from a vessel that went from Tokyo to Honolulu, they found a, a nine-tenths submerged fishing boat that sunk almost completely underwater. So some of that debris is wood. Wow. Some of it's industrial, meaning metal drums and that sort of thing, plastic pipe. Some of it is probably will sink out before it ever gets here. Yeah. So nobody's quite sure what next spring or next summer or fall Can will look like. Can people do anything to help? Because I know people, yeah, there's a big when event it comes to areas like the Haida Gwaii, what can people do uh, to help clean up the beaches? Well, this is a, you know, as we said, it's a, debris is a problem on all of Canada's beaches, whether you're a lake in Saskatchewan or... Or, or Kitts Beach. Or Kitts, <laughs> right? And so the Great Canadian Shoreline Cleanup, which goes in September, people can turn out and help all across the country. And tens of thousands of Canadians do that. That's an aquarium program that we run in partnership with WWF. So many people have responded to this, this specialized tsunami debris issue that we now have a thousand people on a registry who've said, I'll help. Yeah. The problem is logistics. Right. Vancouver. Transportation, exactly. location, all it's that. It's a long ways away. There are not very many roads to the west side of Vancouver Island. Getting it organized so that people can safely go out and pitch in and help clean up is going to be quite a logistic exercise. And that planning for that is what's underway right now. Interesting. Well, and so many repercussions to this as well. I mean, part of the research that we were doing for this, uh, whales were mentioned, mm -hmm. and ingestation, if they're surface feeders and krill mm -hmm. and small shrimp and things like that, you don't really know what the impact is going to be of, of this debris when they're feeding. Right. So that's a concern, wildlife and, and the environment. So are they going to get tangled in it? Are they going to eat it? Or is it toxic? Those wow. are the three things that scientists think about. So humpback whales do skim feed on the surface or come up and take a bite of you know, little small shrimp and krill. Well, of course, if there's foam floating there, they're likely to eat that too. There is no literature, there's no scientific literature at all on what happens when a whale eats a piece of foam. Mm -hmm. Does it digest? What happens? Mm -hmm. I mean, whales have stomachs like cows. They have several of them. Right. So um, we're going to organize, likely organize with the help of the... Uh, the Americans and, and even the Japanese government and consulate, a symposium to bring some scientists together to see if we can... To find out the impact. What's known and what, what, we what can research do. can we do to yeah. find out. Amazing. Well, John, John, always such a pleasure to see you. Uh, if you want to find out more, of course, you can go to the Vancouver Aquarium website. All the information about what we were speaking of today is there. Including the Great Canadian Shoreline cleanup as well in September, so you can keep up to date on that and find out how you can pitch in safely and using the proper Don't logistics. Don't take your rowboat <laughs> no, there. No, do not, yeah. John, thank you, real pleasure. My thank pleasure. You. Thank you. We're gonna take a break.